those uh, solutions are all posted. Um, so occasionally, when things get a little bit busier as we're going along, I forget to post a solution. I should, so just send me an email uh, for a reminder. I'll put them up. path 
upon which our object is moving at any instant we can define with it a normal, uh, sorry, a tangential direction and we'll use as we have before a unit vector to give us that direction and our uh, book uses the notation of E hat as a generic unit vector and then T will imply this in the tangential direction. For Cartesian coordinates of course we use I which would have been the same thing as EX and so on in the other coordinate direction. So uh, for the Cartesian coordinate direction, the Cartesian system, I mean, we make it a little simpler, just use I. But for more general coordinate systems like this, we'll use the uh, tangential uh, or the uh, unit vector symbol E hat and always directed towards the center then is the normal the normal direction. Note that with this coordinate system those vectors will change their direction themselves as we move along the path. In the Cartesian coordinate system the i and the j vectors never change direction, never move, no matter what we did with the origin, what happened in the problem. But as we move along this path, the tangential direction along this path and the normal direction along the path are always changing themselves. So we have to, we have to account for that. So we're going to look uh, most specifically uh, position is just taken along the path somewhere. We can we can do it in normal and tangential directions if we want. Uh, of more interest are the velocity and the acceleration. The velocity is kind of interesting in that there is no and cannot be any normal component. If there was a normal component to the velocity, that means the object, whatever it might be, would be actually moving off the path in some measure, and it can't. It's got to stay on the path. The tangential direction itself is always along the path. Therefore, there is no normal component to the velocity. Let's just leave it as V sub n. It's identically zero. It must be because uh, of the nature of the tangential direction always being along the path itself, just as the velocity itself would be if we are actually uh, describing motion along that path. These are V's. U's look like U's. V's look like V's. That's, that's how I describe it. That's how I remember that V's look like V's and U's look like U's. It doesn't look anything like a U. <laughs> Does it? Even on camera, I bet it doesn't. Oh no, that is, that is such, a, such a quality of Venus to it. It's just amazing. Yeah, that big point at the bottom, I see that. I did see it. Well, no, it's the it's where the rest of the stroke goes that describes the vein division of V and U. All right, so what we will have, though, is a possibility that there could be a tangential acceleration. I'll, have, I'll draw it going uh, backwards, though it could be forwards. This is nothing more than the kind of thing you'd see if you're going along a... Uh, uh, highway and you notice your speedometer needle moving. That's tangential acceleration. If it's drawn like it is there um, with, the, with the backwards acceleration, that'd be a case where you're driving along the highway and the speedometer needle's dropping. So you have a tangential rearward acceleration. 
as an example, I had to draw it either backward or forward, one or the other, and the possibility that there will be a normal component to the acceleration. And the two together give us some total acceleration for these examples. What we always did in uniform, acceler uniform circular motion is the tangential component was always zero. For uniform uh, circular motion, the tangential component was always zero. That's what we did in physics one. We're going to look at more general cases now where that doesn't have to be such. All right, so, uh, well, let's just for emphasis put on some other points just to show that these unit vectors themselves are, are changing directions with motion along the path. So that's something we, we didn't have before, uh, but it turns out to be very useful, especially along very regular paths like these ones would be. All right, so let's look uh, in a little more depth at what we have going on here. So here's some path. We have an object at some point moving with some velocity u. Just kidding, velocity v. <laughs> Make any sense with velocity u? That just makes no sense at all. And we have the uh, coordinate direction at that point. As something like that. If may or may not have a tangential direct uh, acceleration. That tangential acceleration could be either forward in the direction it's moving, could be backward, doesn't matter. It, it depends upon the particular problem. So I'll uh, use what I had there, just do the same type of thing. So we may or may not have a tangential acceleration. But since we're on a portion of the path uh, specifically as drawn that has some curvature to it, there will most definitely be a normal component to the acceleration. And it's uh, that one that's going to take a little bit more study than did uh, than would be a tangential acceleration. The tangential acceleration itself is nothing more than some change in the tangential velocity. Again, for em em emphasis, since there is only a tangential component to the velocity, we don't even put a subscript of a T or an N on there uh, to emphasize that there's just no other possibility but us moving along the path tangentially at any instant. The normal component of the acceleration is the very same type of centripetal component that we had in circular motion, where at that instant, the curve has some radius that we'll call rho. We don't use R uh, because that's what we usually used for a constant radius curve, which is a circle. This is a radius, this, this path has a curvature such that not only will the radius be changing at different times and different places, 
but the location of the center from where that radius is drawn might be changing as the curvature of the path itself changes. So these are things that need to be looked at uh, on uh, almost a piece by piece basis depending on where you are on the curve, uh, where the radius of that curve is and what the radius is. This is very much a concern in uh, civil engineering as they lay out roadways, especially uh, uh, freeway curves where speeds can be kind of high and accelerations can be a concern. Um, and especially uh, entering and exiting a curve, you've got to ease someone into the curve rather than just abruptly have the curve uh, uh, happen. Uh, you can imagine if you're going along a road and then you instantly hit a corner as you would exiting a freeway, you go from a situation of possibly no acceleration to a situation of instant acceleration. And that's not always easily well controlled by a driver or by the, by the car. So you have to uh, instead ease the car with a gradually decreasing radius curve um, so that you don't have an abrupt change uh, of the uh, from a non-accelerating state to an accelerating state. Um, so this kind of thing is a big concern in uh, in civil engineering. But the typical centripetal acceleration that we had in uh, circular in, in uniform circular motion in physics one still applies. This is exactly like the V squared over R centripetal acceleration we had in physics one. Only uh, we don't have R, we have rho for the instantaneous radius of the, of the curve itself, and that's uh, V squared over rho. If you remember from um, Physics 1, though, we had uh, other forms of this when we were looking at rotational motion. If uh, if this is changing, uh, or if this is uh, some angle theta, then V itself is R theta dot, if you remember, from physics one. Uh, we didn't use uh, uh, theta dot there. We used more commonly r omega. That's the notation we used in uniform circular motion. Uh, so this becomes then rho omega squared or rho theta dot squared. Either one's the same. Either one's acceptable uh, and recognizable. What is theta? What theta is, is whatever angle this radius is making from some reference point. We're not interested in the angle th itself as much as we are in how the angle is changing. So theta is just some reference angle. We would, I guess we could use that if we're looking for, for location along the curve, but that's not nearly as much the interest as is uh, speed along the curve. All right, so then, our full Curvilinear normal tangential acceleration might look something like this then in generic terms. We may or may not have some tangential acceleration. Remember, this is very easy for you to see uh, as a, a moving a movement of the speedometer needle if you're going around a, cur a particular curve. 
it could be backward from the direction of motion if we're decelerating, forward if we're accelerating. And because we're on a non-straight path, there will be a normal component as well. In fact, we can uh, say uh, equal to zero on street sections. Well, that's, uh, that's then just rectilinear motion where we didn't have any normal component. We're back to 1D motion, so of course there's no normal component. If we're not on a straight, if we're on a curve of some kind, this is then always towards the center of the curve even if the center of the curve itself happens to be uh, moving as you go along the path because the curve itself is changing. At any instant, there is a, a center to which it is directed. Let's see, we can just uh, add a little bit to this one. Um, that this is also V dot, remember we have no uh, normal component to the velocity, so if we have the time rate to change of that, it's got to be a tangential component. And we could also look at it as uh, R theta dot. That's, what, uh, that's the very same thing we had in circular motion in physics one, only we didn't use theta double dot very often, we used alpha. So that was when we said A equals R alpha from physics. Right, Alex? Sound familiar? A little bit? All right, so we've got those two components. All right, and a couple different ways to write all that jazz. <coughs> All right, any questions on that before I clean the more and go on to something else with it? Comfy? Look kind of friendly from Physics 1? Like a like we're visiting an old friend? Too bad our new friend's not here. Did you piss him off? Guess he figured, oh boy, videos. I'm not coming to class. All right, so let's let's look at a couple problems. Ones that uh, can pertain to the very type of thing you do, especially you knuckleheaded boys, right, Doobie? Which is redundant. Say knuckleheaded boys. So let's look at three possibilities of something a car can do on a circular portion of road. Let's say it at the point of interest, whatever that might be. It's on a curve of radius 2,500 feet. Uh, that's almost half a mile. So these. These uh, high-speed curves, especially coming off of freeways, have to be pretty, uh, have to be pretty, uh, pretty generous. Uh, well, partly we're going to see in a second. Get put some numbers to it. So we'll say a, a speed of about 60 miles per hour. About 88 feet per second. And we'll look at three situations.
find A for three cases. One is that velocity is constant. You pull off the freeway at 60 miles an hour. You keep that speed around the corner uh, a little bit and then uh, come out of the corner wherever else. Also look at a possibility of an acceleration of 2.75 feet per second squared and deceleration of 2.5, sorry, 2.75 feet per second squared as well. And then we'll sketch in the same relative position. Maybe we can label these A, B, and C. Uh, sketch in the same relative position we have there. what this acceleration looks like. So for case A, what's the acceleration as we, uh, as we expect to see it in normal and tangential coordinate system we're using? Zero. Sorry? Zero. Nope. Remember, for these curved situations, we have two components. Is one of those zero? Jake says, yeah. What? Is anything, any part of this zero? for case A, where V is a constant. Is that a nod? Remember the tangential acceleration is any change in the tangential velocity. For a situation where this is constant, then that's zero. Those changing directions. Yeah, because the tangential com coordinate system changes with it. All right. Okay. So it, in the tangential coordinate system, the velocity vector isn't changing. I guess. But the uh, the coordinate system itself is. So. Uh, is that normal component zero as well? No, that's, we have now for that instant, at least the instant, uh, we have a centripetal acceleration. Of uh, e squared over rho. That's nothing more than the type of stuff that uh, type of stuff we are doing in uh, physics one. Right? Um, yeah. Got it, Jake. Check with anybody. 
social skills whatsoever. Unless I force you.
this normal component? Is it zero? I just had to sketch it this way, but maybe it should be zero. In fact, it is it's the same as before. It's unchanged. This normal component is unchanged. We've already got that part of it. What about the tangential part? 2.75%. That's that's given. That's right there. You've got there's very little to do on this one. Don't forget units. However, what's the magnitude of the acceleration and its angle with respect to the tangential direction?
Is it? The tangential direction is always in the direction of motion, which in this case is forward, but it happens to have a rearward acceleration. So Frank's correct with the minus. So he's off duty for a second. Then what? Plus the one point or three point one. We still have the same velocity, we still have the same radius, we still have the same normal component to the acceleration with units. Good. Is it chocolate or coffee? It's in a brown can. sizes at what angle? As shown here, with reference to what's marked, it would still be 48 degrees. What else can we put but uh, that if, if this is with the drawing, it's perfectly clear what the situation is. All right, notice what this means to you as an automobile driver. We know that acceleration, from physics one, we know that acceleration is only caused by unbalanced forces. If there's an acceleration towards the center, it must be supplied by some force. Well, in physics one with uniform circular motion, we call it the centripetal force. What is supplying this force here, though? From whence does a centripetal force come to supply this centripetal acceleration? friction with the car tires. The car wants to go in a straight line, which means it's going at increasingly greater radiuses. Since you've got the car tires turned a little bit, that supplies a frictional force directed towards the center, and that supplies the acceleration. Notice what happens when you're speeding up. Your acceleration increases. This, even though there's a, a tangential component, this is still supplied only by friction with the car tires and the road. More friction is required because more acceleration is required. Which means, uh, and it shouldn't be no great surprise to you, if you go into a corner with your speed increasing, you're even more likely to spin out because you lose the adequate friction to supply the acceleration you need. However, you're just as much in trouble if you go into a corner and you're on the brakes. Maybe if you took a, a defensive driving course or a driver ed, you were told to try to get your braking done before you go into the corner so that you're not on the brakes in the corner. You lose this tangential component, the friction, the acceleration drops back a bit and could be that you're in a, in a safer situation. So don't hit the gas, don't hit the brakes in corners if you can help it. Most of you guys go in the corners too hot don't realize it until too late. 
you are in the gas in the first half of the corner, on the brakes in the second half, quickly getting religion. Maybe you know that happens in situations like those. Jake, you got a hand up? Yeah. Um, what about like when you go into a turn, um, maybe like zero to ten tangential acceleration, you get to like maybe like, I don't know, it's like the apex of it, and then you can like kind of like accelerate and it, it kind of like powers you through it better? Uh, part of that has to do with what I was talking about before, that corners are not constant radius. Uh, They're a little bit bigger radius here, a little bit tighter at the apex, and then they tend to open up a little bit more there. And so what you're actually doing is, is now the radius is starting to increase the normal component. If the radius increases, the normal component drops, and you can hit it with a little bit more uh, velocity then. As the row goes up, so it could be not to the same proportion, but by some measure. And in fact, that's why uh, race car drivers, when they want to do a corner like this, they, they follow a path that does something like that. It's a much bigger radius following that corner than it would have been following this corner. If the radius goes up, so can the velocity, so they can do a lot more speed through the corner then. Plus it pinches off the guy who is just a little bit behind you as he tries to get through on the inside. If you're on a bicycle, then you throw him an elbow, come through the corner, laugh, and you win thousands and thousands of prizes at the finish line. All right, any questions with that one? Now you can drive more safely on the way home. If, you ever even, if you're not texting at the moment, you can think about it. Kids these days. Yeah, kind of short. What are you going to do on the way home, Bob? What are you going to do on the way home? I can send this tape to the county sheriff, you know. And you can't say, oh, I didn't know that would be used against me in a court of law. You know that camera's running. So no excuses here. All right, here's a more more uh, engineering type problem uh, with a little few a few more you know, twists and turns in it <laughs> all right looking at a looking from above here's some kind of industrial conveyor you know you've seen them if you've ever had to go into a UPS facility and look through the back doors, there's all these ramps and things running everywhere and they've got those rollers on them so that the boxes can uh, nicely roll down the... Uh well, look at that. It's a present for you. It's all wrapped and everything. It's that exciting. It's for you. Thought Christmas was over. All right, so here's here's the deal. Start from rest at point A, from where we're going to measure things. So we'll call distance along the conveyor S. So it starts from rest at that point A. About three meters later, what's it doing? Yeah, 10 meters. Three, about three meters later, it starts into a circular portion of, the, of the, the, this conveyor. And that happens to be a radius two meters.
And we'll call down there at the bottom of the corner. We'll call that point B. All the way along the conveyor, the tangential acceleration is uh, 0 0.2 T meters per second squared, where T is in seconds. So, what are the units on 0 0.2? That won't work. Meter per second cubed for it to work. All right. You are to find the acceleration when it's at point B. One quarter of the way around the around the corner there. That's your engineering task as I head on up to the Sagamore for a management retreat. Whole weekend this time. It's awesome being in there. That acceleration, that tangential component, uh, is in effect the entire way around. Huh? B is the acceleration of point B right here. Right. Oh, like the total? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if you're not Yeah. Because if, if uh, the friction between the box and the conveyor surface, those roller things, isn't sufficient, the box won't stay on the conveyor. Is it gravity type? Doesn't matter. Starts from rest has that acceleration, follows that path. So whether it's the little wheels spinning and gets it going, or uh, some guy in a brown brown shorts and brown socks gives it a shove, who knows? So you have to think about this one a little bit more, a little bit more involved than some of our others. Of course, it's going to be made up of tangential and normal components at B. So you have to figure out something about what those are. Is that this? Yes. <laughs> okay, you got that covered. <laughs> B is a position. Acceleration we have is a function of time. So we can't put this acceleration in there directly unless we know the time it took to reach 
point B. So we have the acceleration as a function of time. What we need is the acceleration as a function of position here. So how are you going to do that? OK. 
okay? Did that, did that plan we laid out help? Um, for the first one, the tangential acceleration. Um, the, yeah. So um, we sell for T, and we want to plug it back in. Well, point two and this two. you've actually been given. So, so if you take the given tangential acceleration, you can find the velo tangential velocity as a function of time. From that, you can find the position as a function of time. Since we know the position at point B, we can find the time it takes to get to point B. All right. Let me just plug that in. Yeah. What about the constants, though? What constants? Integrated. Point two is a constant. Oh, when you do the integral? These are not indefinite integrals. I know, but I don't know what the bounds are. Ah. Because it's a, it's ah. a function of time. Ah. Well, that's what we want. Here's how you do it. Uh, how, set this integral up for me. What, what is it you're going to integrate? Remember, we talked about the case last week where you have acceleration as a function of time. What do you do with it? Remember? The integral is 0.2 t dc. Let's see. We're talking about the... The tangential component, acceleration is dv dt. Since we have the acceleration as a function of time, then we'll integrate. At is a function of time, dt. But then your question is, what are the bounds? Well, uh, we know it starts from rest. So we'll call V0 at T0. So there's the two lower bounds. Then that will integrate up to any velocity V, which changes as we go along as it's accelerating. And that's always a tangential velocity. And that will happen at whatever time T. You integrate it that way, that will give you then Velocity as a function of time. Then you can integrate that in the same way for the position as a function of time. That makes some sense, Alex? A little bit? Ooh, a thumbs up. Frank, is that, is that kicking in yet? A drink? Uh, yeah. Things are clearing? Yeah. yeah. What'd you have to get you going, uh, whatever it was, three hours ago? Four hours ago at eight? Uh, I took a shower. You took a shower? Uh, yeah. took a shower in that stuff? Yeah. That, that would help, wouldn't it? <laughs> Just lay down, face down in it. <laughs> Got it? Answer. Check with uh, someone in your academic cell. I'll just make a quick change because I'm not going to right. Not necessarily. <coughs> DJ makes some sense?
Is that what you heard, Bob? Is that what he said?
terrorists. Those guys. <laughs> terrorists. The academic terrorists. Oh, new tables here. For a while. Now, you have, you have it written down as a vector, but then that's not a vector, so it can't be equal. So that's T, that's 5.9 seconds. Okay, 5.7, yeah, that's what we'll set it to get three, right? So, oh, it's so. three, and then this, this turn. Now, put a direction on it. Distance. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I had that as the magnitude. You got to come up with a direction for it too, because you may need to design these rollers to specifically supply that 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 uh, acceleration.